speak for us. We're excited about the opportunity to spread information and education and, and ideally get some resources uh, in the hands of the audience in hopes that we can um, spread the hope and the reality of recovery and uh, as well as um, normalize treatment and just get any resources information to you that you might need. So uh, with all of that being said, thanks so much for welcoming me into your <laughs> Wednesday night uh, midweek. This presentation really is a general overview. It is um, truly a, an ED 101 uh, by nature of uh, defining eating disorders, um, helping highlight some um, common symptomatology from the different types of eating disorders to um, how to respond, uh, evidenced by the title, how to respond to someone you may know and love who might be struggling with an eating disorder. I also provide information on levels of care um, and then we'll share a little bit about our different levels of care and different programs um, in the event that uh, you might need or want to reach out um, for yourself or for someone that you know or love. So without further ado, let me, let me get going. Um, a little bit of true and false to start us off here. Again, this is informational, uh, informative, and um, just wanting to kind of get, get the juices flowing here. So some of these might be common sense and some might have a little bit of a caveat. So true or false, you can identify someone struggling with an eating disorder by looking at their appearance and observing what they do or do not eat. So that is false um, and a bit of explanation. So there is a common assumption that those with eating disorders are only, um, or, or those with eating disorders are visible. Um, it can be visibly identified uh, by being underweight. Um, in reality, um, a lot of those struggling with bulimia nervosa are of normal weight. Um, there's also a, a subcategory called atypical anorexia, um, where uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, where someone struggling with restrictive symptoms, um, they are of normal weight as well. So there, there's a certain mystery um, to the fact that someone may, um, uh, those, that, that are, those that have eating disorders are only underweight. Um, kind of similarly, just because you see a person eat does not mean that they don't have an eating disorder in the sense of eating disorders can be really selective as to when they um, kind of demonstrate their behaviors. So someone who might not yet be ready to identify or admit that they have an eating disorder might really hide it and, and in turn eat when, eat with, uh, when with others, but not necessarily um, eat when they're by themselves. As I mentioned before, eating disorders are very effective at being secretive and sneaky. Um, within that, we often say that uh, our secrets keep us sick. So whatever might be happening uh, in secret um, is often an indicator of um, the, the depths of the illness, so to speak. Um, so true or false, here we go. True or false, eating disorders are caused by unhealthy, unrealistic images in the media, okay? Key word here, because I've got the answer, <laughs> I scrolled too quickly. Uh, key word here uh, is that they are caused, okay? So while, while factors such as media, unhealthy images, and social media can contribute uh, to the development um, of an eating disorder, the causes are numerous. Um, so it's not just one cause, it's multifactorial. Um, a few other pieces there just demonstrating that um, eating disorders have been documented for a very long time. Um, with fluctuating ideals of body shape and size, all to say that it's not just the media that might um, bring about or uh, precipitate an eating disorder. Eating disorders are all about food and body image. Um, so obviously, if you date back to your uh, educational days, the key words and true and false are these all or nothing words. So all about food and body image. And the answer there is false. Um, and we'll speak a little bit more about this uh, later on in the presentation, but we often say that it's not about the food, that eating disorders are not about the food and that there's some other underlying function. There's some other, might we even say secondary gain that is going on or secondary reason that is going on. So it's, it's not just about the food. The food has parts to it. Uh, but I like to say that the food is just the mechanism through which all of these underlying uh, questions or issues or difficulties or barriers or traumatic events are, are manifesting themselves 
okay through the relationship with the food. So a few points there. Though the illness may start out as a desire to lose weight, um, eating disorders or mental illnesses that have little to do with food, eating, or appearance. Uh, it, it, oops, the eating symptoms and preoccupation with fitness are only symptoms of deeper psychological issues. The eating symptoms and preoccupation um, with food in general, with binge eating, um, with even the act of, of getting rid of the food um, are just symptoms of a deeper psychological issue. Eating disorders are an attempt to call attention to oneself. Uh, it's a little bit different of the question. The answer there is false and I'll explain, explain a bit. Um, these bullet points speak to there, there's actually um, a lot of shame that can be involved uh, with, with realizing that the diagnosis of an eating disorder is present. And so actually it's, it, it can be that greater extents are, are um, gone to in, or, uh, in order to conceal the eating disorder. Um, that oftentimes it really is about hiding it um, out of shame versus uh, using the eating disorder symptomatology to call attention to oneself. Um, another important piece, people do not choose to have eating disorders. Uh, as, as mentioned before, they are the result of complex. And then here are some of the, the factors, biological, psychological, sociocultural factors. So key component here is, is secrecy is real. And so oftentimes there's, there's not a direct um, desire to call attention to oneself. People can recover from an ED. This is our last true false. Absolutely true, absolutely true. And if, if this is all that you take away from tonight, I will be very pleased um, that people can recover from an ED. Recovery is possible. Um, so while willpower determination are essential to positive outcomes, they are not the sole indicators of recovery. For instance, full recovery requires special, specialized eating disorder treatment, including medical, nutritional, psychological treatment. We say it takes a village, uh, and that is very true when thinking about eating disorders. And then early intervention with appropriate care can dramatically improve the outcome, and we'll speak to that, that uh, importance of early intervention a little bit later on. So people can recover from eating disorder, absolutely. So this next little bit is about understanding and recognizing eating disorders. So we'll go through um, a bit of information here. This slide speaks to the prevalence of eating disorders. I won't go through every point um, just for the sake of time and wanting to get to a little bit more of the nuts and bolts, but absolutely um, a takeaway from this is um, high prevalence of females uh, presenting um, to treatment with eating disorders. Uh, with that being said, that does not mean that males do not struggle with eating disorders. Um, thankfully, uh, the, um, uh, the norm, if I shall say, uh, in male identifying patients presenting to, to uh, treatment is on the rise. And the history is that there's just been um, severe underreporting. So it's not the males identifying patients do not have eating disorder symptoms. It's that there, there's been a bit of stigma um, and um, culture not to identify uh, with those symptoms. Um, the, the main age at which we see the eating disorder symptomatology present is 12 to 25. That is the onset. Um, whether uh, someone in this treatment at that time, that's a different conversation, but the onset of the symptoms uh, when the eating disorder really starts to, to take place, take root is that 12 to 25 year old range. That last bullet point, um, I will speak to many times tonight, shame and secrecy uh, are just, um, they thrive in an eating disorder. And that obviously leads to denial, underreporting, misdiagnosis, and then obviously inadequate treatment. Uh, a very um, sobering and uh, realistic, real uh, statistic here, that anorexia has a second highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. It used to be the highest mortality rate um, until our opioid uh, epidemic. Um, so that, that's when it uh, became second. Regardless, um, very high mortality rate. So eating disorders are very, very serious. Um, I, I, before I uh, got into this specialty, I don't think I uh, realized the value of that statistic. Um, I, was, I was definitely surprised by it the first I learned of it. So, this will be a brief overview of um, just the different types of eating disorders. So these are the different type of clinical um, diagnoses. 
when it comes to eating disorders. Most of you, if you've, if you've heard of an eating disorder and are somewhat familiar with um, terminology, you likely have heard of anorexia nervosa. Um, and that is uh, whereby one um, might have a significantly low body weight, um, have an intense fear of gaining weight, um, have a distorted uh, mental picture as well as distorted assessment uh, of their own, um, their own body image, their own body weight, um, coupled with extreme focus on shape and weight, um, denial, that, that we know happens with malnutrition um, where there's just denial, there's lack of insight, um, almost a blindedness um, that, that occurs. And then um, underneath the eating disorder, uh, there are different subtypes. Um, so this will just be kind of a diagnostic specifier where you can have anorexia nervosa restricting type. So that is just pure restriction of food, or you can have anorexia nervosa um, purging type. Uh, you can also have a binge purge type. I did not put that on there. I need to add that. Um, so someone who has significantly low body weight, but they engage in binging and they also engage in purging or they engage in just the binging or just the purging. So a lot of different little pieces in there, um, but all of those behaviors could occur even within those main descriptions of significant low body weight, intense fear of gaining weight, extreme focus. Um, so when diagnosing, that's left up to the practitioner to do, but just wanted to speak to the different types, different types of it. Bulimia is also another uh, main category, main eating disorder diagnosis. And so this would be um, reoccurring uh, binge eating. So just a quick definition of binge eating is objectively large, eating objectively large amounts of food in a short period of time. Okay, so just taking in objectively large amount of food in a short period of time, a sense of feeling out of control. And then with bulimia, there's gonna be a use of a compensatory behavior. So this could be um, actual vomiting, this could be laxative use, this could be excessive exercise. This could even be fasting. So it is, it is a way to compensate for that binging that has occurred. So that is, that's what bulimia is, that, that coupling of um, reoccurring, reoccurring binge eating and then that compensation for that behavior. There is a, a, um, a uh, frequency um, specifier down there um, of at least one time per week. But again, that is, um, that's up to the practitioner to decide, but, um, or help the individual decide, but um, the main pieces are the binge eating and the compensatory behavior. Binge eating disorder, um, another main category. Um, so this is reoccurring binge eating episodes, okay? Same definition, um, characterized by eating large amounts of food with, with a sense of loss of control. And then there's even a few more specifiers of what might happen within the, the binge episode. So eating much faster than normal, eating until I'm comfortably full, um, eating large amounts of food when not feeling hungry. Um, so most often with binge eating uh, disorder patients or individuals, we find that they've really lost a sense of their uh, fullness and hunger cues. So that is part of the treatment. Is, is helping them understand what's happening in my body. Am I hungry? Am I not hungry? And learning to intuit a little bit more and connect a little bit more to their physical selves. Um, another component is eating alone due to the embarrassment. So just that's where that secrecy is and that's where that shame really can foster um, and um, fester really is what I'm looking for. It can be fostered and fester at the same time, um, as well as uh, just feeling disgusted and guilt a sense of depression. Um, so diagnostically, there, there need to be three of those, but we often find that all of those uh, accompany these binge episodes to a large extent. And then there's a whole, a whole nother category of um, these different bullet points of what we call other specified feeding eating disorders. I won't go into great deal about these, um, and I won't go into great detail about these just for, for time purposes. The one thing I do wanna to speak to is just because these are called other, okay, in terms of, of diagnosis, these are just as significant as maybe the more um, well-known or the more familiar titles in binge eating disorder, bulimia and anorexia. These are just as medically difficult. Um, unfortunately, we find that insurance doesn't recognize these as much. I think that is in part um, just to lack of education and in terms of the severity of them. 
um, and, and maybe um, less of the population dealing with them. Uh, but that term other can, can often um, signal that they're not as um, significant or they're not as serious and that's not true. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, so this is often, uh, often seen in, in adolescents. This is a very um, common eating disorder within the adolescent population. Um, one way, kind of in layman's terms that I like to describe this is um, a, a just a very, it's, it's the very picky eater that has since um, kind of felt that the consequences and the repercussions of that very, very picky eating in the sense of um, there's an eating feeding disturbance um, and, and just an overall failure to meet nutritional needs. Um, that can be significant weight loss, that can be nutritional defici deficiency, um, if there's dependence on uh, oral nutritional supplements. Um, it, it's just the, the, the really picky eating um, uh, exponentially <laughs> presenting itself and can really cause some interruption and in, um, just significant dysfunction in life and really interrupt um, normal pace of life and normal relationship with food. Okay, so um, on to recognizing this this little, this little piece, the next few slides, I get into a little bit of um, some similarities between temperament and these different eating disorders. This might kind of uh, feel a little clunky at first, but um, fascinating research on um, the, the connection between um, temperament and these eating disorders. So it's a little bit of um, chicken or the egg in the sense of um, those struggling with eating disorders often have this temperament. And then uh, when, an, when um, an eating disorder takes place, this temperament is really um, highlighted in the sense of the, the eating disorder kind of latches on to that and, and um, magnifies it. So just, just kind of something to think about if you have someone um, that you're concerned about or you're, uh, you know, this is even relevant to yourself, if you're struggling, um, thinking about some of, the, some of your own temperaments and how, how it may um, uh, play into the eating disorder uh, symptoms. So here with anorexia nervosa, common temperament um, styles, um, har a sense of harm avoidance. So just avoiding conflict, avoiding harm. Um, another kind of phrase is kind of playing it safe in the sense of not wanting to ruffle feathers, a very cautious individual. Uh, next bullet point when I mentioned um, neurotic, that just means um, just, just some irrational thinking or maybe um, unrealistic expectations or um, unrealistic thought processes, um, ob obsessional um, qualities in terms of temperament, a focus on detail, um, a, a kind of underlying root of, of anxiousness, which can play into the obsessional um, thought processes or maybe some irrational thought processes. Perfectionistic, um, I'm jumping around here a little bit, perfectionistic. We know that that's um, kind of a, a, a well-known temperament quality for anorexia nervosa. And we see it play out. We see the eating disorder just really kind of latch on to that and, and want um, kind of rigid guidelines and rules and, and by the book. Uh, low novelty seeking, this just means you're not a risk taker. Um, so if, if uh, your, your loved one, your support person, I might be struggling with this. It just means not a risk taker. Uh, and then very, very low self-esteem. Temperament and bulimia nervosa, some, some overlap. Um, again, harm avoidance, some anxiety, low self-esteem. Interesting uh, difference here is you've got higher novelty seeking in that there's some risk taking, there's some impulsivity. Um, and, and with that can come a little bit of dysregulation just in terms of a little bit of a roller coaster. Uh, and if you think about the nature of bulimia nervosa, um, there's kind of two qualities to it. There's, there's, there's this, this binge that, that's a little bit more impulsive and there's that compensatory behavior um, that's a little bit more harm avoidance. So you can see how the temperament kind of plays out in some of those behaviors. Binge eating disorder. Um, so high impulsivity, also highly harm avoidant, which is interesting. Uh, sensitivity, low self-esteem, lacking purpose, um, sense of dependence, and then also some of that dysregulation. 
I have uh, I have spoken to this in terms of the predisposing factors, but wanted to provide that Venn diagram and then some examples there of um, the biological psychological factors and then that sociocultural aspect. Um, I think a way to summarize this slide is um, Cynthia Bullock, a well-known um, giant, if you will, in the eating disorder field. She has coined the phrase that I've used in educational events with students, as well as obviously with uh, professionals that um, genetics loads the gun and then the environment can pull the trigger. A bit of a, um, um, what's the word, vivid image um, and really explains how there's this underlying predisposition and then the environment can really just set that off in terms of what we might be genetically loaded for. I will not get too into detail here, but a main takeaway is that the comorbidity with eating disorders is very high across the board in terms of depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety and substance use. This is actually a whole other presentation uh, that we're providing in April in terms of the complexities of the comorbid um, diagnosis, but um, very high comorbidity eating disorders and these five um, mental health diagnoses. I've always said in my practice, I I've never just diagnosed an eating disorder. And in all my years, it's always been, there's always been um, secondary diagnosis. There's always been a secondary uh, mental health um, uh, issue and, and uh, symptoms that they are, that individuals are dealing with. So high, co high, comorbidity, high co-occurring uh, mental health diagnosis. This speaks um, a bit more to why is there so much comorbidity? And when I've got these four different explanations here, this is getting into a little bit of um, the chicken or the egg in terms of what comes first. Is it the depression that comes and then the eating disorder? Or is the eating, does the eating disorder increase depression? Does the eating disorder increase the, the anxiety? Um, maybe the eating disorder and um, anxiety, depression, substance use are caused by the same underlying thing. That would be the common cause. So maybe something happened and then um, both eating disorder and that co-occurring mental health struggle happen at the same time, they increase at the same time. What we do see is that over time, um, these co-occurring mental health issues will start to shape each other. Um, and this, this is difficult. This is really where we start to see some of the, the more entrenched, um, um, just more entrenched symptomatology that we really have to um, unwind and really have to untangle at a higher level of care. And, and that really comes with time where um, those, those comorbid uh, symptoms and eating disorder can start to shape each other. Um, and so we, we really wanna separate those, treat them at the same time, uh, but as much as we can separate them. So there's not, they're not influencing each other. I spoke earlier about the quote, it's not about the food. Um, so as we, as we continue to understand what the eating disorder really is and, and how it happens, um, I think a, a really nice way to, to conceptualize it's it's not about the food. So then that invites the question, well, then what is it about? If, if the food is just part of it, then, then what is it about? And eating, eating disorders function as coping tools for more serious, painful underlying issue and feeling. These are just a few. This is not an exhaustive list, um, but something to think about in terms of if you're, if you're wondering um, could it be for comfort? Could it be for control? Could it be avoiding of intimacy? Could it be avoiding of, of maturation? Um, just a, a fear of growing up, a fear of launching, a fear of, of independence. Um, we call it maturity fears. That is a real, real thing. And if you remember from the earlier slides, eating disorders really start to take place and take root from the ages of 12 to 25. And what happens in those years? We grow up. And so the idea of maturity fears uh, can absolutely be an underlying reason um, for an eating disorder to, to, to rear its head um, and uh, to keep someone young due to that fear or keep someone sick due to that fear and, and maybe 
the fear of I won't be cared for if I grow up. Um, so all of those reasons can, can feed into uh, an eating disorder. Um, unresolved grief, um, identity questions, lack of self-awareness, lack of self-assurance, um, um, fear of success and failure, just lots of different um, reasons and underlying issues and feelings. So all, uh, all of these um, possibilities really beg for the opportunity to explore it more. Uh, in, in some form of therapy. So let's get into the responding. Watching my time here, okay. Let's get into the responding piece. Um, I know this is uh, probably what, what you're most eager <laughs> to know about. Um, so the best way to help someone is with an early diagnosis and a prompt referral to an experienced eating disorder train team. Um, might be kind of obvious, but we know that early intervention is, is key. And so um, this slide just echoes that and provides some, some evidence for it. Um, so early identification and treatment, um, this will improve the speed of recovery. This will help reduce symptoms. So we'll really keep symptoms at bay uh, as much as possible and not let um, the shaping take place that we've talked about earlier um, and you know, eating disorder um, informing other um, mental health issues and mental health issues and forming the eating disorder. So early identification and treatment uh, can absolutely play a role in um, reducing those symptoms. And then obviously early identification and treatment improves the likelihood of staying free of the illness. We know that recovery is possible. And so all of, all of, um, all the more reason to identify early and, and seek treatment. When left untreated, eating disorders tend to become more severe and less receptive to treatment. That's absolutely true. Um, it, it's, um, it's, in, it's harder uh, when, you've, when you've been struggling with it for 15, 20 years. It's, it's just a harder habit to interrupt. Doesn't mean it's impossible to, it just means it's harder. And so all the more reason to, to stop it early. And then screening improves access to early intervention. So screening will be the gateway to, um, where, where an individual needs to be in terms of what care. Here are some keys uh, to knowing when, when do I need to refer? Um, whether you're a, a professional joining us or uh, you have a loved one um, or a friend or a coworker, um, the, these are um, some things that you may or may not observe just depending on your interactions with, the, with, um, with your loved ones. Uh, but these are good signs of, hey, there might be something going on specific to an eating disorder. So if there's obvious weight changes of concern, um, if there's a rapid or persistent decline in food take, um, if there's a sense of loss of control over eating disorder behaviors. So obviously if someone expressed, hey, I, I don't feel like I can stop benching. I don't feel like I can, um, I, I don't have a sense of when I'm full. I don't have a sense of when I'm hungry or I, I'm just not able to actually eat on my own, um, or I can't stop purging after I do eat. Uh, just that sense of loss of control where, where they don't have that strength anymore. Um, hope, uh, ideally they would be that transparent and that honest with you, which means you, you have opened the door to communication, um, which is just wonderful. Um, so if there's a sense of that loss of control, loss of progress with less specialized care, um, this may be unique to any providers that are joining us, but if, if you're an outpatient and there is no progress, that is a great indicator uh, that someone may need to step up, um, that they, they just might do better, will likely do better with, with more care. Um, it will be easier for them with more support, not that they can't do it in outpatient and they don't have to try as hard when there's just more structured support around them. Co-occurring psychiatric disorders, the reason I say that is we just know that, that those can exacerbate the symptoms um, and those can intensify the, the reality of the eating disorder. Obviously, need to refer up if meal supervision is required. Um, and then obviously, if there's uh, medical complications uh, that might, might arise as a result of the eating disorder, malnutrition, dental issues, um, gastrointestinal issues, um, could be many slides in terms of medical complications that require um, stabilization or require any medical care. Um, but, but that's another wonderful, um, well, 
um, a good marker as to when someone might need to step up. This slide just speaks to what goals of treatment are. So um, looking at, okay, I need more meal support. Um, I've got some medical complications. Um, I don't, I can't try this hard by myself and outpatient, I need to step up. This is what would be the, the key goals of treatment. So nutritional rehab, um, and that can be um, creating that normalized eating behavior, creating that normalized uh, relationship with food. Um, being able to engage a little bit more freely with food uh, versus it being within such um, rigid all or nothing binge purge or um, rigid rules uh, within some of the restrictive qualities uh, of a relationship with food um, or within ARFID, that, that avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, that would be um, just some of that pickiness. And so all this is all about that rehabilitation with um, regards to nutrition as well as relationship with food, healthy thinking about weight. Um, so, so really, um, you know, not having distorted ideas or definitions about weight, not placing a value on the number of weight and, and learning to see it as a number versus a, a value or a meaning. Um, obviously treatment of emotional problems contributing to eating disorder Increased family support and, and awareness, uh, one of the key reasons for this presentation, and then obviously prevention of relapse. And so these, these are really the key overarching um, goals of treatment. These are some typical screening questions um, that, that can be really helpful and that can kind of help engage or help gauge uh, an individual around how, how how significant is this? I know I'm having some questions, some symptoms, some, some struggles, and how significant is this? And so these screening questions um, just get the, 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 well, the questions going <laughs> and can really lead to the need for um, further assessment, an official assessment. So what percent of your day do you spend thinking about weight, shape, or food? A pie chart, you know, how do I spend the, my, my days? Um, looking at a pie chart. Have you attempted to manipulate your food intake to change your body? Um, that can really be a signal as to how much of a hole does, does my mentality around food or my relationship around food, how much, how much of a hold does it have on me? Um, do I manipulate my meals, my time of meals, who I see when I have my meals, who I don't see when I have my meals, and, and how much does it control of your day? Do you eat in secret? Do you feel shame or guilt around food or your body? Um, do you avoid social interactions because of food or because of your body? And then do you, do you use restriction exercise purging as a method of, of justifying or compensating? Um, so if answering yes uh, to one, two, three, all of them, I, it, it's a great question uh, in terms of, okay, what's this really about? Um, so some good screening questions. This is, this is purely informative, just in terms of the eating disorder world uh, and what levels of care are um, uh, offered within eating disorder treatment. So the most um, less intense, <laughs> I'm, I'm losing the word I want, uh, but the most, just the, the least invasive, the least intensive uh, level of care is outpatient. Um, and so that's typically one therapy session a week, one dietary session a week, um, maybe every other week, um, psychiatry once a month if you've got, if you need um, psychiatric services for med management. So that's outpatient. And you've got intensive outpatient. And you'll see an asterisk next to levels one through three. Those are that are offered at ED Care. And I'll speak a little bit more about that at the end. Um, so I'll speak about what our IOP is. Uh, and knowing that across, really across the country, um, the, the length uh, of, of these um, IOP days and um, partial hospitalization days, the hours can vary a little bit from program to program. Um, but our intensive outpatient, um, that can be anywhere from three days a week to seven days a week. It's part of our step down from level three, the partial hospitalization. Um, and so th those two go hand in hand. So partial hospitalization is 10 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty intensive, um, pretty involved, definitely about interrupting behaviors. And then the IOP, the intensive outpatient can be seven days all the way down to three days. 
Um, you can also see um, IOP, intensive outpatient, um, in the evening. Um, so that, that allows someone to still be involved in their life during the day, go to school, take care of family, um, go to work, and then still have that support in the evening. And then four, five, and six really are the more um, kind of putting life on hold to go to treatment. I would say partial puts life on hold too. I don't want to under, underestimate 10 hours a day. Um, but residential inpatient really are about stabilization and then acute medical um, here in Denver, that is about the intensive um, ICU medical stabilization of eating disorder, of patients struggling with eating disorders. So level six is, is the, the sickest of the sick, um, just very acute, um, significantly medically compromised, um, and it is truly a, an ICU, ICU unit uh, for eating disorder patients. So a um, little, bit, little bit of levels of care there. In terms of responding, so these are some considerations for when you're addressing someone that you care about. Um, so these are just some helpful hints. These are in no way um, have tos. These are not, um, you know, this is going to work for some and not other in terms of um, just different temperaments and personalities. I will say that um, you're gonna know your loved one the best and these are just guidelines and, and helpful hints that we have found to be useful over time in conjunction with what we know about eating disorders and how, how they need to be approached. Um, and so just a few, few pieces to comment on here. Avoiding advice and or comments about observations. Um, I would say advice, advice really is the piece. Um, we, we actually encourage our patients not to give advice to each other uh, when they're when they're in um, our EIOP and IOP and PHP, um, more of just joining, okay, um, and and being with the person versus, well, this is what I do would do, or this is what I think you should do, or this is what I read I think you should do. Um, that just I don't know about you, but sometimes when others give me advice, I kind of just want to walk away, <laughs> especially if I didn't ask for the advice and I really just need them to join with me. So as much as you can, avoiding advice um, and or comments um, about what they're observing with eating disorders. Um, and then keeping the focus there on just how the behaviors are impacting um, the well-being. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's acknowledging, hey, it appears you're struggling. Um, how can I help you? Or this is what I'm worried about. Um, this is how I see it interfering with our relationship and, and I miss you and uh, want to be near you and feel it coming between us. Um, obviously avoiding accusatory or judgmental language, um, trying to avoid an argument. We teach a lot of communication skills and treatment and um, the importance of um, stopping and, and rebooting if needed in order to avoid an argument. So it's fine to take a pause, it's fine to take a break. If, the, if you're the words are escaping you, it's fine to come back to it. Um, this next one, I think it's bullet point number five, accepting that, that your loved ones don't need to admit anything. And, and I think that can be so hard when we know that there's something to admit, when we know that there's an elephant in the room and, and for their sake, we want them to admit. Heck, for our sakes, we want ourselves to admit it. And yet the shame and the guilt that's involved there can just be so difficult. And so maybe taking the focus off of, you have to admit, you have to admit, just say it, just say it. Um, that's not really what it's about because that will come with time. This is more about showing them um, that you care and that you see that they're struggling. Um, I, one of my favorite quotes uh, came from a medical um, professional uh, that I'm very well familiar with. And um, he just said, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I, I think that has a lot of relevance here. Um, so they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So yeah, I think that's, that's relevant. Um, avoiding attempting to solve the problems on your own. I think that's, that can be hard. Uh, the more you care, <laughs> the more you want to solve it and fix it. Uh, for, for others, and um, they've got to come to that on their own in, in large part, and so there, there's a bit of a dance there. 
Some other considerations, obviously consulting, um, absolutely. Um, I know Erin made herself available and I wanna make myself available as well uh, for, con for consultation. Um, just happy to think through how to navigate some of these difficult conversations. Um, don't be inactive, um, get professional help, avoid gossiping, avoid a pol policing. Policing is, is kind of that hovering, um, just kind of watching and, and that comes out of, that can come out of um, concern and fear and can also be a, a real um, barrier, especially for an eating disorder that can be kind of competitive. <laughs> And so it can kind of became a, become a, a, game, a game of catch and, um, cat and mouse. And so as much as possible, not policing versus I'm just conversing. Um, definitely don't promise confidentiality of keeping a secret. I mentioned earlier, secrets can keep us sick. Um, secret, secrets do keep us sick. And so um, tr trying not to collude with the illness in that way. This is, um, I'll, I'll give you just kind of a minute here to look. So this is just a great list of do's and don'ts. Um, if we were in person, I would print this off and give it to you uh, as a takeaway. Um, but this is just a lovely um, uh, handout really of do's and don'ts. Um, so do realizing there's not a quick and easy solution. Uh, the, the opposite, don't ever give up. Uh, this is a long-term illness. People recover every day. Um, so you kind of have a do and a don't. Um, do talk to the person about your concerns, ask questions, listen, um, don't ignore the problem, okay? Um, do, I think, uh, let's see, this is number five or six down. Do plan social activities, which do not involve food. Culturally, we do a lot around food. And if you know someone is struggling, we still really want to emphasize that connection piece. And so if there's a way to do that, um, not involving food, um, that, that's a part of the process is, is getting them to connect in different ways. And so definitely not, not forgetting that. Um, sorry, I, I went a little too soon. Um, let me show there's nothing else I want to point out here. Yeah, just some helpful do's and don'ts. Hopefully you got it chance to look over that. Um, here we have, th this is our treatment philosophy. This is our empowerment-based treatment philosophy, connection, acceptance, mindfulness, sense of self, and action. All of these are core components to our treatment approach at ED Care, all vital um, pieces of recovery um, of the treatment process. I mentioned the connection piece. Um, the acceptance piece is just that accepting the reality of the eating disorder, um, mindfulness, connecting mind, body, spirit in a non-judgmental way, sense of self, probably a whole nother presentation, but um, just really trying to separate that, that eating disorder from their identity, um, for lack of a better word, um, that, that authentic self. And then action, it's just practice. It's, it's a very simple <laughs> definition of our, of our philosophy with regards to action. Practice, practice, practice. I, just for the sake of time, so we'll have a little bit of time for um, questions and answers. I won't go into great, great detail about um, our different sites and resources, but um, we'll leave up the, the um, uh, contact information at the end. So if you are joining us and um, are interested in our services, please reach out and I'm happy to, to help consult what point you in the right direction. Um, so just a little bit about our different programs. In Colorado Springs, we have an adolescent intensive outpatient program. This is for 14 to 17 year olds. Um, it is four evenings a week, um, three hours from four to seven, and Monday through Thursday. There's a gradual step down from PHP or IOP um, or a step up from outpatient. Um, it's family-based. And so um, families are very involved in meal therapy. Uh, and groups and education. Um, so this is our adolescent program in the springs, um, as well as we have an evening intensive outpatient program in Kansas City and Nebraska and Colorado Springs. Um, so these are for adults, very similar um, model in the sense of uh, four nights a week, um, four and a half to five hours, four hours, 
it's four hours, <laughs> uh, four hours um, an evening, um, master's level clinicians, um, and then our PHP. Um, so I spoke a little bit about this earlier, 10 hours a day. Um, this is in Kansas City and Denver, 10 hours a day, seven days a week, very intensive, comprehensive, um, important pieces. We have um, housing uh, in both, uh, both locations. Um, for our partial hospitalization, so we can provide that additional support. Um, I spoke a little bit about IOP earlier in terms of a step down from PHP, um, so that can be seven days a week, um, anywhere from, from three to six hours a day. And then the last slide, I know I went through that really quickly, <laughs> the last slide is um, just some other resources, just wanted to provide these for you, um, however they might be helpful as you're navigating um, just learning more or maybe needing to provide some resources for your loved ones. So yeah, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much. And we have a handful of questions that have come through and hopefully in the next 10 or so minutes, we could try and get through four or five of them. You okay. think that's doable? So one of the first questions somebody asked is, how is the best way to talk to someone you love about body checking and constantly looking in the mirror? Mm. Is this a common behavior and how can I help them feel more safe and supported? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it's just expressing that concern, um, expressing that um, what appears to be a struggle um, and um, kind of creating that safe place. Because if we think about what the function is of that checking or um, that, that act of how do I look, what's going on, um, what's, my, what's going on with my body, we can assume there's a certain level of unrest internally. And so I think an antidote to that is just kind of creating that place where they can feel comfortable um, expressing what might be going on. Um, but true to the do's and don'ts, don't want to ignore it, absolutely, and want to express, hey, I'm concerned, um, that maybe you experience them as, as kind of um, going away, you know, when you find them uh, looking in the mirror or find them um, body checking, they kind of disappear, they, they escape, they go somewhere else. And, and so just expressing, I miss you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on with you in those moments, but would love to be here to talk about it. Um, that might feel threatening to them and don't let that scare you <laughs> in the sense of um, that behavior, if I could call it that, is, is um, being identified and that is likely what they need. They just, there just may be some initial, no, it's fine. Stop talking to me. And, and that's okay. That's, that's common. Um, but don't let that lead you to ignoring it. Yeah. So it's a dance. It, it's definitely a dance. Um, hopefully it goes smoothly in the first two or three times and keep trying. Absolutely. That is a great answer. Um, just jumping right into the next one. Do you have any advice on supporting someone in a work environment who um, directly reporting to someone that you've noticed changes in behavior and significant weight change, but only seeing them off a video call, especially if they've mentioned that they've struggled with an eating disorder in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, a, little, a little bit of the same um, as the one before, given you know, some, some work dynamics. I'm, I'm, a, I'm taking kind of a lot of liberty here to assume, <laughs> assume some things within the relationship. Um, I just, I will keep going to the secrets, keep us sick. And I love that they've already identified that they've struggled in the past. Um, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here. Um, assuming this is a current situation, COVID has absolutely um, just wreaked havoc on the presence of an eating disorder in the sense of we've seen a significant increase um, of eating disorder symptomatology um, for the same reason that we've always had connection as one of our core tenants of our of our treatment philosophy, we have all lived in a year plus of disconnection. And so um, start there, start with the connection, start with the reaching out. Um, 
calling to their attention that they've already been so vulnerable and trusting of your relationship by sharing that they've struggled in the past and that you're worried about them, that you're noticing some, some differences in them and, and you're worried as to what that might mean. Um, how can you help? How can I support you? Um, policing would be, what are you doing? What's going on? I don't see you eating. Are you eating? That's policing versus this is what I know because of what you've shared. Um, this is what I see and how it worries me. And what can I do? Do you need resources? Do you need a person? What is it? Um, so just don't be afraid to ask and, and let them know of your worry. Yeah. Uh, so another question on a little bit of a different note than the past two, mm -hmm. do you have a recommendation for clients whose insurance will not cover inpatient treatment, but mm -hmm. um, is really struggling pretty severely and is not willing to utilize free resources? Wow. Um, so insurance won't cover inpatient. Mm -hmm. Um I guess my question is, is there a level of care that they will cover? Um, I, could, I could go into kind of a whole separate conversation in terms of single case agreement possibility. I'm happy to help, help you walk through that. <laughs> that would be of help. Um, but single case agreements are possible um, with an initial, hey, we don't cover or you're out of network. Um, and then not willing to utilize free resources. Um, I, sorry, I'm pausing, so I'm not sure which, which way to take this answer. Um, the, yes, it, it is difficult. Um, I know that there are certain levels of care um, that insurance does not readily cover. Um, I do know there's various organizations that do offer scholarships. Um, so I, I do not wanna say that treatment is not an option. And I don't wanna give that individual who might otherwise be feeling a little bit of shame, could be feeling some shame or um, some uncertainty as evidenced by not wanting to utilize free services. Um, I, I don't wanna give the eating disorder an out. Um, so honestly, I would say call and consult and let us help you find a resource. <laughs> that, that would honestly be my, my answer just cause um, don't want the eating disorder to have a way out of this one. I agree. And you mentioned free resources and mm -hmm. or um, free resources. Um, scholarships. Scholarships. Thank you. And one of the ones that comes to mind immediately is Project Heals Healer Circle. And they specifically offer treatment scholarships for those struggling with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. I, um, they're a nonprofit organization and um, do great work. So um, the last questions, kind of a twofer, what's the best way to help somebody that doesn't want help mm. or also somebody who is in denial of the severity of mm. their eating disorder? Mm. Stay the course. I would just say stay the course. Um, um, have known uh, patients and loved ones throughout my life who um, they, you know, not ready to hear, not ready to listen. And what we know about the long-term nature of eating disorders is they will need you when they are ready, um, just as much as they need you when they're not. Um, so they need you to be both the voice of reason and, and the, the one um, calling attention to and expressing concern as well as the one that later when they do come to it, um, they, they don't, you know, they won't need the, I told you so, they will need the, I am so glad and I am very much here. And so stay the course, it is hard. This is where that um, consideration is one of the bullet points under the consideration of how to help a loved one. It said, um, maintain appropriate boundaries because there are gonna be times where they're not ready um, to acknowledge it. And that's the eating disorder. That's the denial. So if you feel that ira if you feel that irrational belief and you, it's as if you're just looking at the eating disorder because of the amount of denial and you see something and they say, I don't see it. That's the eating disorder. 
and know that that's not them, okay? <laughs> know that that is the illness and um, that you can continue to be the voice of reason, continue to be the voice of care and that you get to be there then when they are ready. We know that there's phases with treatment. We know that there's phases of they might do a little piece here and then a little piece later. It might not all come at once. Um, so stay the course. Um, and they may not be able to thank you for it. I hope they can. Um, but recovery needs individuals that can stay the course, support people for sure. And it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, um, but it is, it is possible. It's possible, recovery is possible. What does Anita say that it, uh, the National Eating Disorder Association put out a study that it takes 10 times of inviting someone to mm. seek treatment before mm. the individual struggling is willing to pick up mm. a phone and make a call to a treatment center or. Mm -hmm. um, so last question. Yeah. yeah. Somebody is wondering if a dietitian should be involved when a person is um, not eating very much. Yeah, I, I think that is a, it's a great um, assessment. It's a great service. Um, dietitians are a part of our village, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, in terms of assessing the severity of an eating disorder, um, that's, that's definitely an avenue um, and, and can be part of, part of the puzzle. Um, if anything, just to establish a, a normalized um, uh, relationship with food. Absolutely. I am a dietary, nutritional, um, rehabilitation in all sense of the word. Absolutely. Great, great route to take. Um, very informative, vital uh, professionals to the, the whole gamut of very minimal symptoms all the way to inpatient, residential, uh, acute um, needs. Absolutely. And that's something as well that if you are looking for outpatient dietitians in your community, if you wanted to reach out to an ED care, whichever ED care is closest to you, we're, we have a pretty good pulse of dietitians that we trust in the community and we're always happy to offer recommendations. I'm always in their offices every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. And thank you everyone so much for joining. We will send this recording of the webinar out to everyone, whether you made it for the live version or you yeah. watch the recording um, at a later date. But thank you so much. And please feel free to check out our Eating Disorder Awareness Week events throughout the next um, couple of days. And uh, as well, we have an event with Sonia Renee Taylor, mm -hmm. the author of The Body Is Not an Apology on March 4th. Yes. So a little belated Eating Disorders yes. Awareness Week celebration. But thank you all so much and hope to see you at future events. Bye. Bye.